All right. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks to John for inviting us to come and speak to you this afternoon. Uh, so I'm Mike Berry, and this is Brian Card, and we're going to be talking to, talking with you about a uh, a project we worked on this spring for a graduate course in data visualization, uh, visualizing MBTA data. Uh, so to give you a bit of a backstory, so Br Brian and I used to work together at a satellite communications company, and um, we uh, were we were both taking um, both working on a master's master's degrees part time through uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and uh, this spring we took uh, took the data visualization course with uh, Professor Matt Ward, who's uh, an, a, one of the leaders in the field, um, and this was our this was our project for that. Um, so we both we both went into this course um, already having read a lot about data visualization as it relates to different projects uh, at work. Um, we had both, Brian had read a lot about human-computer human interaction and interface design. I had read, uh, I'd done a bunch of D3 projects, and we both had read a lot of uh, Edward Tufte and Brett Victor's works. Um, but we, we saw this course as a, it was a good kind of forcing function for us to work on a project together uh, to see what we could do, and also to learn from the other people in the class. And, and of course, uh, Professor Ward. Um, so we could pick any topic that we wanted to, and we chose the uh, MBTA subway data because it both impacts us. Um, so Brian, we both ride the uh, both ride the T, uh, but in different contexts. So Brian rides the T uh, on the the weekends to go and meet up with friends, and I commute on the T. So I take the commuter rail to South Station and then the uh, red line up to uh, Kendall Square. Um, so we thought that ha coming into it from two different perspectives uh, would give a, would make the end product more applicable to um, to a bigger audience. Um, so once we decided to uh, once we decided to work on the MBTA data, we started collecting um, collecting information or pulling down their real time data feed, which gives current locations of all the trains on the system. Um, so we pulled that for the entire uh, month of February this year. Um, so this caught some snowstorms, uh, hockey games, basketball games, uh, various events. Um, and we pulled that for an entire month, and then we spent uh, about another month, so March, uh, making uh, mock-ups and prototypes and um, just uh, getting all of our ideas together and starting to flesh a couple of ideas out. And then we spent um, April tying those together into the finished report uh, that, that we're showing here. Um, which we turned in for the end of uh, end of class around the beginning of May, uh, but that got us about ninety percent of the way to what we wanted. So we spent uh, another month or so after the class ended, kind of tying up some loose ends and putting in some chart keys and uh, a couple of other um, little nice nice to have things that we wanted to do to get it polished. And then on June tenth, we, uh, we we launched this, uh, posted it to Twitter and Hacker News and Reddit, uh, and it got a really um, Great response from the community, better than we ever thought that it would. Um, we uh, we got a, a couple of retweets and comments on Twitter from our heroes, uh, Brett Victor, Mike Bostock, and Ed T Edward Tufte. Uh, we also got a couple of kind words from some of these uh, news publications up here. Um, so <clears throat> this talk will mostly be at a high level uh, about our design process and some of the um, some of our uh, implementation process as well. But uh, we're not going to really go into too deep into any uh, details. But if you want, if there's something you're curious about, definitely feel free to ask us ask us questions. So Brian will get started talking about uh, our design process. Okay. Uh, does everyone have handouts? Anyone missing a handout? There's some extra ones by the door there and also in the back. Um, and also, just show of hands so we get started. Who has seen the website already? OK, I'd say about half, about half. OK, that's good. Um, so as Mike said, this is from a graduate course at WPI. And the design process that we used was based off of Professor Ward's design process. And so one of the first things that we did after choosing a data set was choosing tasks that people would use the visualization for. And so what we did in that case is we turned it into a set of questions, which are on the handouts. Um, those questions are, where's the congestion in the system? How do special events affect the system? And then as a commuter, 
can I look at this and take something back that's going to improve my commute? And it was really helpful to outline these, and we kept referring to them back uh, during the design process and the implementation process. Uh, it's, when you're working with data, it kind, of, it kind of clouds your vision a little bit. You tend to think in terms of what's easy to do with the data instead of what's actually useful for people. And so having these laid out as, you know, we know that these are the important things uh, helped us keep on that right track and, and try to focus on things that people would actually care about. Um, so after we did that, we looked a little bit at some existing works in the field. And so I'm just going to walk through these pretty quickly. Um, this is what we found. So this first one is a graphical timetable. This is by a French inventor named um, Marais. And it was done in 1885. And the way you read this is time is along the top and stops are along the sides. And the diagonal lines are the trains. And the slope of the, the line is the speed of the train. So if it's more steep, it's a faster train. If it's less steep, it's a slower train, right? Because it's covering fewer stops in more time. And this is a really influential diagram. If you read Tufty, the second Tufty book actually has half a dozen different variations on this one diagram. So it's, it's very well known. Um, the second example is called the BART widgets by Brett Victor. It's from 2005. And this is a scheduling app. Essentially, you put in a start point and end point, and it tells you how to get there and when the next train leaves. And then also, crucially, when the train leaves after that, and then the next one after that, and the next one after that. So this is focusing on the schedule. This is also focusing on the train schedule. Um, this next one is from the state of California's Department of Transportation. And what they've done here is they've taken the original Murray diagram and they've encoded it with the, they've encoded each of the trains with the number of riders that they see on each line. And also, uh, crucially, they've added a legend here and some numbers so we can actually compare these. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then this last one is a little bit closer to what we were doing. This is called Metropolitan IO. It's a visualization of the Paris Metro. And they used similar uh, performance data to us. So once we took a look at what the existing works were, we went through mock-ups. We probably did two dozen, two dozen different mock-ups. And then after that, we went into prototypes. And it's this, you know, it's an iterative process, right? You have a whole bunch of ideas and you distill it down into essentially what you think the essential ideas are and iterate off of them. Um, and, and this one in particular, you know, went through several different iterations. Uh, what's interesting about this is actually the prototype was just this. Um, structure here, and this actually played through time. So you open the page and it would just sort of play through time, very similar to the header in the beginning of the report. And we've, we changed that to add these horizon graphs so that you could actually play with time over several different days. It was much more effective that way. We also changed the colors around. You know, here we had this uh, red, yellow, green type encoding, and then we went to this white, black, red, which is sometimes called a heated object scale. Um, or the classic example of that is from black to orange to white, so like you're heating up a bolt. So in this one, the red is the delay. And then we change it to this red-green sort of fast-slow. So it's just this iterative process trying to go through and, and refining your ideas and trying to figure out what's going to work best. The first set of prototypes that we did were actually just an attempt to get the data onto the screen. And You'll see here, these are three prototypes. None of these are actually in the report. Um, but they were all useful for us for trying to understand what was interesting about the data. And once we understood sort of what it looked like, then we build other prototypes that highlighted those things that we thought were interesting. Uh, I'm not going to go over these. Some of these are actually, this one at the end is pretty interesting. So if we'll have time, um, you can ask about that if you're curious. And then afterwards, once we had the prototypes showing the data in the way that we wanted, that's when we did the website, the interactive text, um, all the layout, and, and all of that, and, and then finally published it. So that was generally the, the process that we used. Now, while we were going through and building this, there were certain things that we were thinking about. And we call these our design concepts, and they're on the second page of the handout. Um, and these are the type of things if 
we were going to attempt something similar to this, I think we would try to apply these same techniques. And these might be, might be things that you could apply to. So the first one is uh, about this essay, Up and Down the Ladder of Abstraction, which was a big influence for us. Does anyone, just show of hands, has anyone read or seen this essay? Well, we've got two, two, three, okay. So I'm gonna actually walk through it pretty, pretty quickly because I think kind of the point of this is it's really crucial to understand how we organize the paper. So one of the ideas, I hope I'm not misstating this, is that uh, people build models in their heads and of systems and these models are convenient to think about the systems, right? But they don't necessarily show you higher level trends and patterns that are useful for being able to explore and understand them. And so to see those higher level trends and patterns, we build abstractions. And the abstractions you know, make those things clear, but they actually look less like the model. And we can actually build abstractions off of abstractions which show us higher and higher level trends and patterns, but they le look less and less like the original model that we're trying to look at. So an effective way of, of managing these abstractions and also just exploring and understanding systems is to give the viewer the ability to move up and down between these different levels of abstraction and to tie them together with lightweight interaction. So in the paper, his abstraction is a car on a road and there's a bend in the road and the car hits the bend in the road and it's gonna turn a certain um, degree. And you'll see he's got uh, a little simulation. You can see how it works. He also has these interactive widgets, so you can sort of play around with it. You notice there's graphics, there's these interactive sliders, there's this text. It's broken up into these sections. He sort of goes along and um, outlines the different controls that are in his system. And then he provides you with an abstraction, which the abstraction is the car on the road over time. Well, actually, the car is not shown here. It's just the abstraction, which is the path. And you can, you can play with this path, and you can see all the different ways that it changes based on what the angle the car is turning. And then, crucially, he then ties it back down to the original model. So here you've got a car on a road with a path, and you can see where the car is going to go based on the path. And he provides higher and higher levels of abstraction. Here he's abstracting over all paths. Um, I'm just gonna sort of skim through these different things. He's showing you different views of the system, different views of the data. Um, you finally get to you know, these types of things where there's many, many different visualizations and you can play with this and it's highly interactive. Um, and there's also, there's some artistic elements here. You notice that this flows over onto the other diagrams. And um, I know this is Python and R, but this is written in um, HTML canvas. So if you've ever done something like this, this is really hard. So um, he's doing some interesting things here. And then finally you get to this one, which is his base level of abstraction. And if you just started the essay at this point, this would be a really hard thing to read, right? It, you don't really know what to make of it. There's a red section, there's a black, there's a white section. Uh, kind of looks like a foot. Maybe that's just me. Um, but this is actually a really convenient way of thinking about that system. And if you interact with it, you can see what these different sections mean. The red is on the road and stable. And then the white is sort of this off the road, unstable. And then the black is somewhere in between. Um, and then you can hover over the sides and you can see essentially a slice. You can see all the different things, right? So allowing you to move between those different levels, tying this diagram back to the abstraction. Okay, so back to subway visualization. What is our model? Our model is trains on a map. And which map? Well, it's the map that everyone sees. It's the subway map that the MBTA publishes, right? And so when you open the report, is it this one? Yeah. Okay. That's what you see. This is what we open the report with, which is the model of our system. Um, and we hope that, you know, by playing it and the way it's presented, you might be able to guess that this is a subway system. We don't explicitly say it, but there's subway in the title and you can see these dots moving over time. You know, time is increasing. And actually, if you hover over here, you can see these are the different stations. So that's our model. Um, an abstraction of that model is trains on a map over time. So here's, our, here's the abstraction, which is highlighting all of the different trains moving over time. 
with our original model, and what we do is we tie them together with lightweight interaction. So you can hover over time here, you can see how the trains move, where the trains are at specific points in time, and there's other interactive elements too. You can click on the lines and you can see where they're going and things like that. Um, but that's one thing we were thinking about is essentially thinking about these different levels of abstraction and how to tie them back down to the original models. So, like like I said earlier, um, Edward Tufte's works were one of our one of our uh, major influences for this project. And what he likes to see are, um, and also I hope I'm not misstating this, but uh, what he likes to see are uh, static visualizations mostly that uh, show all the data in one field of view, so you can visually make comparisons. And he argues against having some data over here and then later some data over here and where you can't compare them because you don't see them side by side. So kind of taking that idea to our, uh, to our project, we tried to, um, we tried to make it as, we tried to get as far as we could without interaction as possible. So as you can see, it's pretty interactive, um, but the big format is just a tall web page um, that you can scroll through um, it's just, yeah, just a tall web page that you can scroll through, and um, and <clears throat> and we tried to design we tried to design it uh, in such a way that everything is right. It's uh, everything is given to you statically, and you didn't have you don't have to uh, navigate through um, navigate through different uh, different steps to get to see the data. Um, so this is, this is kind of like designing with color. So color and interaction are both uh, powerful tools, but um, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, uh, so, you, so like with color, you don't want to, so you want to try to go as far as you can just with a grayscale design, and then add color towards the end of the design process to show relations, add layers and layering and separation, uh, and to, um, and to give that little extra uh, dimension that you might need to, to see the things that you're trying to see. Um, and, and in the same way, you don't want to start off uh, your design process saying we're going to make this, require this interaction to see uh, stuff, to see anything from our, to get value from our uh, project. But um, like I said, we do, we do end up with a lot of interaction on the screen. Uh, and as much as possible, that. We try to make that uh, interaction to enhance, uh, to, to magnify, to show more detail. Um, so it's kind of extra over the top uh, um, enhancement instead of something that's required to see the data in the first place. Uh, and a couple places where we um, compromised on this uh, were uh, down here on the, this is a, visualization of congestion and delay uh, for one week, uh, the first week of February. So uh, you can see this is, this map shows what the train, what the system is like at a particular point in time. Um, so what we really wanted to do was show this map uh, using small multiples or uh, organized across, across the screen. So you could see in one field of view how, how uh, see, basically see all the data and make comparisons without having to uh, see things at different times. But the uh, due to the well, th this would have worked on paper. Um, you could have made things small enough, but still have seen the resolution that you were looking for to see those relations. But on a computer screen, if you make this any smaller than we made it here, you start to lose the, the fine details that you need to resolve the what's going on here. So we compromise and um, and made it so as you drag across here, you see what the um, you see what the system was like at that point in time. And also, as you drag down, you can see that time at di uh, across different days. Um, and then the same same thing happened up here, where we were just trying to show um, we got we were able to get turnstile data from the MBTA, so they gave us a gigantic CSV file of every um, every station on all of the uh, the subway lines, and for each minute, how many people entered and exit exited from that station that we. Um, that we mixed into our uh, data visualization here. So the same thing here, you can view each of these stops uh, for the entire month. 
Um, but if we tried to show all of these visualizations, it would just be overwhelming and it would take up too much space on the screen. So we, we hide them um, in these little expandable drawers you can pull out. Uh, but in both of these cases, um, as much as possible, we try to show you a summary of what's, what's, um, what's hidden down below. So we show you uh, the total number of, total number of uh, entrances over, I think it's over a day. Uh, over the average day, and then also a summary of what the average uh, weekday and the average weekend look like, so you know uh, approximately what you're going to get when you expand it out. And the same thing down here, this little slice, uh, the gray slice shows you the total amount of, total number of people entering the system at that point in time, and then the red or green shows you a summary of are things slow or are they fast. So we compromise a few places uh, in showing all the data at once, but when we did compromise, we tried to uh, give you a summary of, uh, of what we weren't showing you at the time. Oops, and I am talking next. Are you still talking? <laughs> so <clears throat> another thing that we another thing that we did, or another thing that you won't see on our visualization any place, are checkboxes, sliders, uh, input widgets, buttons. Um, Tufty calls those kind of things administrative debris. Um, and, and you can, th so what we, what we did instead of that was um, we have, word like instead of buttons, we have words in sentences, word, hyperlinked words in sentences that are organized into paragraphs. So instead of having a button with a couple words on it that may not make sense out of context, we have words that you can click on just like a button that are sitting inside of sentences that explain exactly what those words mean. Um, and also, when you click on those words, as much as possible, um, they're non, your actions are non-destructive. You're not gonna change the state of the visualization uh, such that you can't get back to where you were beforehand. Um, so, I mean, too, too often, uh, it's easy to kind of get caught up in the containers for our visuals, uh, containers for our, our visualizations instead of the content that we're trying to visualize. And using this technique of, um, using this technique of using information as your interface instead of man-made widgets as your interface, uh, it, it serves to shine a spotlight on your content and keep keep the keep the focus on that instead of the stuff that you're trying to do to visualize it. So an, another specific example when we did that was <clears throat> this visualization right here. So we were talking a lot about the uh, ladder of a uh, ladder of abstraction and trying to follow those design concepts. <clears throat> so we started off with this this visualization up here that was just animating the trains through time, and then we wanted the ability to control this map over time. So at first we were thinking, well, let's just use a slider that you can slide across, it has time on it. Um, but, then, but then we thought, well, instead of having this slider, oh, so we, we were aware of the Mary diagram, but we um, didn't, uh, we were aware of the Mary diagram, but we didn't want to include it because we knew that a lot of people had a tough time reading it. Um, sometimes it doesn't make too much sense, especially when we would have to show it vertically where time is actually going down instead of to the side. Um, but we realized that instead of a time slider that you, that you drag across, this Mary diagram is serving the same purpose, except it's completely filled with uh, information instead of, instead of a widget. Um, so the, the slice here across, <clears throat> across the Mary diagram is a summary of what the, what the map is going to look like at that time. Um, yeah. So one other thing on the handouts, um, it says that we, let me just look up so I've got, integrating words, numbers, and graphics. So this is something that we did. Um, as you can see, there's, you know, there's words and numbers and graphics all over the place. I think one way to think about this is you have to think about what each medium is good at. So words are very effective at clearly explaining a specific thing. And tables are, show, are good at showing many specific things, but not necessarily clearly explaining them. 
And graphics are good, at least in this context, for showing a higher level of trends and patterns that you wouldn't be able to see with either of those things. Um, and they become powerful tools when you tie them together. So for example, in this table, you, it's much more information dense. This was a good way of displaying this data, but it doesn't explain what's going on. And so we accompany it with text that actually explains what's happening. The same thing in this diagram here. The visualization allows you to see these higher level trends and patterns, but you almost kind of don't know what you're looking at. And so we give you a sentence here that explains exactly what happens. The locations of each train on the red, blue, and orange lines at 658 which is exactly where the, the line is. So that's sort of thinking about how, to, how do you integrate those things in order to more easily get your point across. And I think one of the big things we did was we used a lot of text. There's a lot of text in the whole report. There's text in the graphics. There's paragraphs explaining you know, essentially what's going on and how to set it up and things like that. So that was one thing we were thinking about when we were going through and doing this. The other was, and as, as I explained earlier, so those first set of prototypes, those were just for us to try to understand what the data looks like and what the interesting things were. And throughout the report, we're trying to show you those pieces of interesting things. And, and we do that for a couple reasons. Um, the first thing is that it really engages people. It lets people know, it, it gets them familiar with the data sets that they're looking at you kind of have to think about your viewers as really busy, right? Maybe they're not going to spend that much time looking at this. Maybe they'll only spend 10 seconds. Maybe that's generous. Maybe they'll spend five seconds and then just go on to the next thing. So you've, you know, one thing we do is we give them highlights. Um, and we try to do that in each section. The other thing you'll notice is that even though we have a whole month of data, we don't give you, for instance, a drop down that lets you pick the data look at. Right? We only give you one day. It's just Monday, February 3rd. And that's because it's the most interesting day. Now, you have to be careful here with you know, any time you're sampling your data set um, to make sure that it's really portraying an accurate picture of what the data looks like. And that's one of the reasons why we have the source code and the data for this online, uh, so you can pick through and look at that. But this was, from what we found, this was the interesting day. Uh, we also show you interesting things that are happening this day. So here's some text, a disabled train causes delays on trains after for over an hour. Notice how this causes delays in the other direction as well as trains immediately arrive at Alewife and then turn around to go south. And I can see this too if I hover through this slowly. You'll notice about here, there's no trains going in the other direction inbound on Alewife. And then eventually as it gets here, they'll start to fill back in and pick up those passengers. Uh, we have another disabled train here. We have, so here are these little bits of data. They almost look like errors, but actually what's happening is the META is moving trains between stations at night. So it's trying to put them at these end stations. So here it's moving this one to the end. It's moving this one to the end. In this visualization, we looked through this data and there is this trend where several of the stops had many entrances in the morning and many exits in the evening. And so we called these home stops. We figured this is where people were living and they were going to commute and coming back. Um, and we show them to you. So here they are. So we show them in the data set. We show them on the map. They're sort of on the outside, which you would expect, I think. Um, you can expand them and you can look and you can see they just all sort of have this spike in the morning and this spike in the evening. Uh, and then we found the reverse. We have these work stops, which are here. You can see them on the map. They're kind of in the middle. I think that makes sense, too. And you can see they also sort of have this pattern. Um, and also, some of these higher level ones, they have a lot of people exiting. Where in the home stations, there isn't really that big jump. And then there's other stations that are just sort of busy all the time or have more interesting patterns. Uh, in this visualization, um, so if you're not familiar with this, this allows you to pick two stops, and then it gives you this scatter plot showing how long it's going to take you to get to those between those two stops given the time of day. So here at 5.30, um, it takes uh, between 10 and 17 minutes. Oops. I, I changed the time, 7 to 9 minutes. And you can scrub this, and it'll show you a different time of day. So the point of this visualization, if we go back to our tasks, is to 
allow commuters to come to this and to take away something that's going to help them with their commute. Um, and we also provide all this text at the bottom that sort of explains what's going on and, and highlights some pieces of data. Uh, so for example, if you look at this section, you know, it takes about the same amount of time, regardless of the day, to travel because there's the wait, tra the transit time increases at rush hour, but so does the number of trains, and so that causes the wait time to decrease. So about, it takes about the same amount of time. Um, if you look at the blue line, it's a very different pattern. Essentially, transit time never changes, but your average wait time will go down during rush hour. So it's actually better to travel at rush hour, or at least you'll get there faster if you travel at rush hour. And the orange line has this behavior where the wait times are highly variable. I think this is because the trains are breaking down a lot. But still, I mean, if you're traveling at 7 PM, it could take up to an hour just waiting for a train, which is, which is pretty incredible. Um, but we had a lot of people look at this who weren't from Boston. So if you're in New York City, if you're in somewhere else in America or somewhere else, and you came to this section, you know, if we didn't provide those insights into the data set, you would just skip over this, right? You'd look, you wouldn't understand the subway line. You don't travel between any of these stops. There's no reason to stop here. And so adding these little bits of information that are what's interesting helps pull people in. And it also sort of gets them familiarized. This is a pretty big blank slate going from any two stops. So there's a lot of different combinations. So we summarize it, we show you the highlights, and that sort of encourages you to, to go through and, and pick more things. All right, so <clears throat> there's, a, there's a bunch of things that we wanted to do but weren't able to do. Um, uh, if I have time afterwards, I can show some of the uh, some of the blooper reel. But I'll, I'll go to go to one specific example uh, here. So we had this turnstile data that showed people entering and exiting from each station. We also had the movement of the trains, and we really wanted to figure out how crowded each individual train was, so that we could make these kind of point-wise comparisons between uh, con between how crowded it was and how slow it was going, um, kind of like. Uh, in our handout, they were able to do in this visualization. Oh, this is, this is an aggregate we're trying to show for each individual train. But from this, from the data sets that we had, we just couldn't truthfully make that make, uh, show how crowded each in individual train was. We thought about uh, deriving some kind of model. Um, of knowing when people are entering and knowing when people are leaving, but the exits miss about 20% of the people because there are some exits that don't have turnstiles, so you can just kind of sneak out. Um, so we would have had to do some approximation, and um, also when you when the train gets to a split, you don't know if people get off and what direction they go. Um, so we kind of decided that if we had modeled our data and visualized the model, that that would have been uh, would have been lying to our audience. Um, so I, it's often it's temp tempting to, to derive models and visualize the models, especially when the underlying data is messy or doesn't look the way that we want it to. Um, but well, th th that's an important task. Eventually, we do want to derive models and understand those models. But visualizing the models instead of the original data um, doesn't help you understand the data set like you're originally setting out to do. Um, and sometimes models are hidden in your data. So for example, uh, down here, at first we were rendering this visualization based on, um, based on MBTA reported estimated number of seconds between stations, which it turns out are derived from their own internal model of looking at the previous, I think, rolling average of the five previous trains that passed through a section and they then add up all the sections. So that was actually a model in and of itself. So we ended up having to go back and calculate, instead of using those numbers, calculating the vertical distance between basically each of these, each of these points uh, when the trains actually got from one station to the next station. So went through and calculated those, and it painted a much different, much more volatile picture than, um, than what the MBTA, MBTA was showing through their smoothed averages. So 
I'll talk uh, briefly about some of our implementation details. So does anyone here uh, work with D3? A couple of people. Okay. Um, so this, or this is all in D3. Um, so on our handout, we talk a little bit about our, our data collection pipeline. So like I was said originally, we, um, we pulled the MBTA's data feed for all of February. Uh, this was just bash scripts uh, running uh, cron, uh, cron jobs on old laptops. So in parallel, we pulled these, uh, pulled the, uh, the data, data feed for the entire month of February. This generated about 20 gigabytes of raw data. Uh, so we wanted to clean and merge it into one, uh, one data without, or one set of data without any duplicate information. So we ended up writing scripts uh, in JavaScript or running in Node.js. Uh, we could have used Python or R, but uh, we, we don't write JavaScript on a daily basis, so we wanted to kind of immerse ourselves uh, immerse ourselves in JavaScript for the back-end data processing um, so that we'd also be comfortable uh, doing the front-end work. Uh, so yeah, we wrote some scripts to merge our duplicate data sets into one common uh, clean data set, which was about 200 megabytes. And then for each data visualization, we wrote an uh, extraction script that pulled out the minimal amount of data that the browser would need to render uh, the visualization, uh, usually about one megabyte, although we were kind of pushing that on a few of our, a few of our visualizations. Um, and <clears throat> then we built the web application uh, using D3. Um, so building a, a story or report in an interactive data visualiza uh, web-based visualization it's kind of like building a house. Um, the, web, the web platform, uh, SVG, HTML, CSS, um, Canvas, WebGL, provide the raw components that you're, that you're working with, like your, uh, your wood and your, your uh, uh, sheetrock and everything. And tools like D3 provide the, uh, provide the uh, yeah, D3 and other, other tools like that provide um, what you need to kind of tie them together uh, to build the blueprint that you've set up in your in your mockups and your prototypes. Uh, so we we found out that um, to really be effective in de designing and building uh, this data visualization, we had to read through all the D three documentation. So we understood all the power that our tools provided, um, and we also had to um, we also had to learn a lot of the SVG spec um, that we used uh, building, uh, building each of the interactive charts. So specifically, um, there's one place on our visualization. So right here on the, on the Your Commute visualization, when you click and drag from one, um, one, part, to an, one part to another part, we didn't want to implement uh, routing between, between lines. So we just allow you to drag to other um, other stops on the same line. So we're kind of scratching our head, thinking about how we're going to implement those rules. And um, we had read through the uh, we had read through the D three documentation and realized that they provide a Veroni utility, which basically takes a set of points. Um, so in this case, it takes the set of possible destinations from this input, and it renders polygons where each polygon is the locus of points that are closest to that input the associated input point. Um, so basic, and then we added hover listeners uh, to those. So as you're dragging around, it, it's highlighting the one that's closest. So we can show this visually over here. Um, this one is the same thing, except it has a flag turned on that actually shows the polygons instead of rendering them uh, invisible. So when I start dragging from here, you can see <laughs> we anywhere I drag, that's on the uh, polygon, <laughs> the polygon for this input point says that you're going there. So same thing up here. Yeah. So when I drag from this point at the intersection, um, whatever whatever polygon I'm hovering over, it goes to that point. So this was kind of something that it's explained in the D3 documentation, but you really had to um, kind of think. Like, how do I actually you incorporate that abstract concept into uh, into uh, something that actually needed needed it? 
Um, another place where specifically knowing um, all the different parts of the SVG spec was important was uh, this visualization. So we were originally drawing the uh, congestion or the delay portion of this, the red and green on the bottom, as, um, as rectangles. But then we realized that um, we could draw, so um, SVG allows you to have a uh, gradient, a color gradient. So we realized we could just draw the whole thing as one rectangle and say that the background was a gradient um, where each of the stop colors was, uh, was mapped from our input data. So this little spot here is a, uh, is a from our input data says this time was slow and this, this one here says this time was fast. Um, and that's really something that's also, it's like you could read, through, you could look through the SVG spec and see that it's there, but then you have to kind of think, oh yeah, I can use that to, to actually visualize data in my, uh, in my report. Um, a couple of other things that came up. Um, so building a responsive, so building a, so we built this uh, visualization, showed it to a couple of people. Uh, so I showed it to my dad and he looked at it on his, so we, we both developed on our MacBooks and everything looked great. Showed it to my dad, he uses it on his iPad and says it's, it doesn't work, I have to scroll sideways to see things. And um, another one of my friends said, I'll only look at it if I can, I'll, I'll only look at it on my iPhone. If it doesn't work on my iPhone, I'm not gonna look at it. And, uh, and uh, Bill Shander, uh, another guy in town, uh, gave us some feedback who, um, he looked at it on a very high resolution, large monitor, and he said that we weren't using enough of the available screen real estate. Um, so we, we realized, okay, well, we need to make this uh, responsive. So we pulled in uh, Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, we customized their, their responsive design utilities. Uh, so we had, we have three, uh, widths that we render this at, the widest being this 1200 pixels and the narrowest being 768 pixels. So that gave us some of the flexibility we needed to support different screen sizes. But then when it comes to actually re-rendering the SVG, when you change the screen size, that's a little tricky. You can't just say take up 80% of the width and it'll automatically adjust. You have to say it's a fixed number of pixels wide. So this visualization here of uh, turnstile entries and exits during the month, when we make the screen narrower, it actually just applies a scale factor to that. So it never redraws it. It just says, okay, you're 50% bigger or you're 25% smaller. Uh, and that worked for this one. But then up here, we wanted to, we didn't want things to be shifting up and down. So instead, we just re-render the whole thing every time the screen changes. So it's a little slow, but since you're not re-rendering all the time, you're not changing the screen width all the time, um, that was an acceptable trade-off. So those are two, I'm sure there's more uh, ways you can deal with that, but those were two ways that we found to do it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. There's more, um, more technical details in the handout. Um, feel free to ask us uh, any questions and also our uh, repo is on, our code is pushed to GitHub, so feel free to uh, pick through that, uh, ask us any questions on Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just to wrap up, we, we were able to talk with the MBTA and got a little bit of feedback from them. Um, you know, they were, they were pretty happy with the work that we had done. And we also found that one of the things that they said, which was really interesting, was the report didn't necessarily show them anything that they didn't know, but it showed all those things that they already did know to everyone not in the MBTA. Um, so was that a bad thing? <laughs> so, I, well, there's, there's certainly a case can be made about transparency and government data and, you know, having the resources to, to do this type of stuff, you know, so that people, people using the system know how it works, right, and try to make that, yeah. Did they comment on whether it's a conspiracy that they <laughs> I think it's a little, yeah. They wouldn't comment, yeah. But yeah, we can take questions, yeah.
what you were talking about with the words and how you're integrating the lips into the words. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike doesn't sleep, right? So, <laughs> and also the, in the course, um, it forced us to slow down. So, if we were working on our own, we probably would have collected our data in February and then sometime in March come up with some ideas and then started building the final product. But it kind of it forced us to um, spend a month or spend a spend a while just coming up just coming up with mockups and then spend a while just implementing those into prototypes. Um, which so, yeah. is why we had so many prototypes, you know, and why we were able to throw away prototypes. Which, I mean, that was really useful in narrowing down the ways that we wanted to look at the data, you know, and, and um, gave us the ability to scrap things that we didn't like. So just in terms of how do you, I mean, the, the process that we went through was that process. We essentially went through the data, tried to pick those interesting things, and then once we understood what was interesting, how do we best visualize that? And then once we had that on the you know, once we have those prototypes, that's when we filled in all the interactive text and all that stuff. It's definitely, I mean, I say, and then we filled in the interactive text. I mean, that's a lot of, it was a lot of work just doing that. But in terms of how do you bite it off, and you know, each section was sort of its own little thing in itself. So that helped, you could sort of just focus on that one piece. And I also ride the uh, commuter rail. It takes a little while to get in, so I spent an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon working on this, completely immersed in train stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so a question in the back. Mm -hmm. Now, we have this data for the MCA, and we have to try to keep it still, and I would never say that. <laughs> I can't see this very large uh, screen in high definition, and it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the question was, have we seen this, uh, these live train maps in London, which they take the real-time data and they put them onto these maps? Yeah, so we haven't seen. I haven't. I haven't seen that. No, yeah. I haven't either. Um, there are a lot of apps that are built off of the MBTA's data API. Last time I checked, there was like seventy. So there's there's quite a lot of work there. I don't know if there is something similar, but those are all mobile applications. Which and your point is that having it that on a high resolution screen with all the detail is um, much more makes it much more accessible and usable. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay. It, it, yes. Yeah. So the yeah the question is what's the what was the most challenging part of the time you spent or the one you spent the most time on, right? Do you want to answer that, Mike? Um, I would say we spent the most time deciding what the final thing was going to look like, because uh, like some people asked us if we were concerned about all the D three work um, making us not be finished in time and turning it in late. Um, but really, that, that stuff, once you have an idea in your head, you can turn that into reality in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. But um, what kind of worried me towards the end was that we still didn't know, like, how are we going to show congestion and delay at the same time? Um, yeah, from a design perspective, that if you pull up the congestion delay diagram, the third one, 
it took almost the entire course to come up with the idea for this. I mean, we struggled so much trying to figure out how do we show both of these things together in a way that was viewable that wasn't just a mess of massive data, you know, and be able to show more than just a day of data or an hour's worth of data. So, um, yeah, and it just was just thinking about it over and over again. So eventually we got there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What happened to the green line? So the question is, what happened to the green line? I, I don't think the MBTA wants to release the green line data. That's. <laughs> Um, we would still be working on this. If right, there was yeah. Green line data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the data feed that we had, um, there was no green line data available. There is some, um, some of the station data, actually, if you go online and look at the station data, the green line has some stations. So there is some information there about when people are entering and exiting. But yeah, for the actual train times, we don't have anything. Yes? My Yeah, so the comment was that the yeah the GPS tracking on the green line is a has been a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it's non-trivial to power it because of the way the cars are structured. Yeah, the red. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just gonna say the red, orange, and the blue line um, have a this old system for coordinating trains, which has um, segments in between each stop or in, in between each pair of. Uh, all across the, the, the uh, system, there's uh, these segments, and um, they get uh, notifications every time. Data comes in every time a train crosses from one segment into another segment. So that's why they could easily provide this real-time data for these lines. But the green line doesn't have that. Um, yeah. So uh, what was the other question? question? So the question is, if we were going to do another project, could we, yeah, what data set would we pick and be able to spend that much time on and, and um, that we think would be interesting to work on? Um, I'll let you answer that. Um, well, I mean, government data is the interesting stuff, right? You want the, you want, and, and one of the reasons we picked this, we actually had a couple of different topics. Mike wanted to do the marathon. Yeah, Boston uh, Marathon. Boston Boston marathon. marathon. I wanted to do... Um, ski racing, because that's what I do, which if there's some really, would be some interesting ways to do that. But we picked this because it affects the most people, right? So if we did, the, the Boston Marathon would have been interesting, but um, that actually does affect a lot of people too. We could have done something neat with that. Um, the skiing, not so much. So I think it would have to be a data set that um, reached a lot of people and pro was able to provide some impact or interest in them, something people do every day. You know, so I don't, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but it would have to fill those requirements. Do you have anything? No? Okay. Uh, there's a question over here, I think. Yeah. I, I haven't used Node.js, but I was surprised to hear that it's much faster than Python. Do you have any comments on that? More details? So the so, question, yeah, the question was, um, uh, I was surprised to hear that we use Node.js uh, and that we found it faster than Python. Well, I'm wondering why that is. And I think that's because we're not very good with Python. Um, <laughs> we just did a, when we were ver first starting out, we just started writing some data processing scripts and like the simplest kind of Python thing that could uh, do the basic transformation over our flat files that we wanted, that we were able to. Uh, same thing, uh, Python, I did a little bit in Scala, because I, I use Scala at work. Um, and then, um, and then Node.js. And the Scala and Node.js were about the same, but Python was substantially slower. And I know there are libraries you can use that will increase the performance of things like that. Um, or some of the techniques that we saw earlier um, from some of the other speakers would help. But we just, um, we, we thought if we were gonna invest time into learning uh, something, learning more about a language that we should focus on JavaScript because that's what the front end would have been in. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to add? That's one of the reasons why I wanted to come to this conference to learn more about that and try to have a better understanding about how to 
work with Python because it is so prevalent in that sort of data engineering analytics space. I don't think that using Node.js slowed us down any though. Um, I mean, the other thing is uh, someone else had asked us about databases. We didn't put this in a database. It's all flat files. It's all just text files. And that was a design choice that we made. And I don't think that really slowed us down either. But there are different, you know, different ways to solve this problem. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.